James Edward O'Brien is a British journalist, television presenter, radio presenter, and podcaster. He's one of the presenters, as many of you know, on the talk station LBC, presenting on weekdays between 10 and 1 p.m., hosting a phone-in discussion on current affairs, real-life events, news, and views. He hosts a weekly interview series with Joe entitled Unfiltered with James O'Brien, and he has occasionally presented Newsnight for the BBC. Uh, I'll have a bet with any of you that Brexit may or may not come up in the next few minutes. Please join me in welcome our keynote addresser, Mr. James O'Brien. I think that's the first time I've heard my radio program described as um, emblematic of hopelessness in society. But uh, we'll, take, we'll take whatever compliments we can. Um, I, I, I'm a little embarrassed to be here this evening, to be honest with you, because the notion of social justice is one which is uh, almost certainly better promoted by actions than words. And having been on a crash course in what, who is Hussein, do and represent, and indeed on the man who inspires them, I, I'm minded to point out that most of the people behind the organization and most of the people um, behind us being here this evening already do rather more actions than a, than a gob on a stick like me does. I, I specialize mostly in words. And it is, of course, actions that, that speak so much louder than words, but I'm going to have to stick initially at least to my field of expertise or alleged expertise, which is words. And the two words at the center of this evening's proceedings are social and justice. Um, I'm not sure I'd heard the phrase social justice until relatively recently. And somewhat typically of the, of the zeitgeist, somewhat typically of the strange period of history that we seem to be living through, I, I think it, it first reached my ears as a, as a pejorative, as a negative, because there's a word you're supposed to stick on the end of social justice, which entitles you and somehow enables you to undermine the sincerity or the good intentions of people who believe, like everybody involved in who is Hussein and presumably everybody here tonight and presumably every decent person on the planet, uh, social justice should be self-evident. But when you add the word warrior to the end of the phrase, the social justice warrior or the SJW, it has become an insult. It's become uh, a phrase that is used to mock the idea that some people believe in helping those less fortunate than themselves. It's become a phrase that has been offered up as a evidence that anybody who stands up in public and claims to want a better life for someone other than themselves must be fraudulent, must be hypocritical, must be a social justice warrior. So I started thinking about the words and I started thinking about other words that have been similarly corrupted. And, and the more I thought about these words, the more I wondered whether actually there's a sort of there's a uniting theme here in the, what would you call it? I suppose you'd call it the, the adversity to social justice, the idea that some people want to undermine efforts to do the right thing, to, to be helpful. And, and I was sort of thinking about this for the last couple of weeks, and then I, I, I was reading the Financial Times magazine this morning. I, I like to read the Financial Times on a Saturday because I, I like to remind myself that they're there are people in the world who can spend £15,000 on a toaster. It's a, it's a very glossy supplement. But, but, the, but the column at the front of it this morning looked at liberal resistance. And liberal, again, is one of those words that is um, uh, very, very hard, increasingly hard to pin down. And, of course, crikey, there is a theme emerging here. I can't believe it. Liberal is also a word that has been turned into an insult, that has been turned into a pejorative, as if there's something somehow suspect about believing in fundamental freedoms. But what this piece in the Financial Times pointed out was something that I, I, I suspect people who, who have both feet in the West historically um, don't really understand. I, I suspect that if you have family and heritage in the Middle East, it's probably rather easier to appreciate. But we have a, a tendency, I think, in this country and also very pertinently at the moment in America to think that a, a, an oppressive regime or an authoritarian regime, a, a populist uh, but oppressive government won't last very long. We, we think as Europeans of perhaps Mussolini or Franco or Hitler and we think of their window of power 
as being vanishingly small and one which ultimately, and in every single case I've just cited, was closed quite quickly by the forces of liberalism or, if you think about it, by the forces of social justice. And it's not true, actually. As you see Viktor Orban in Hungary consolidating power and espousing uh, profoundly Islamophobic and anti-Semitic tropes and somewhat more worryingly sending a letter of gratitude to Conservative MPs last week for propping him up in Parliament when every single other Western government had issued a very, very strong condemnation of his assaults upon the rule of law and freedoms. That would be British Conservative MEPs. And I said I wasn't going to get political tonight. Sorry. But we are where we are. So these regimes don't necessarily disappear in the blink of an eye. They don't necessarily buckle under the forces of liberalism or social justice. If you look at European history, you will see uh, up until 1848, really, when the revolutions began to sweep continental Europe, that, that actually deeply authoritarian, deeply oppressive regimes were commonplace. And, and the strange role of the liberal is the urban liberal, if you like, perhaps the metropolitan elite, to coin another phrase that has been turned into a pejorative. Essentially, it means someone brilliant who lives in a city. But of course, in the hands of Brexiters and Donald Trump fans and sundry other halfwits, metropolitan elite has become an insult. Don't try to be brilliant, whatever you do, and don't live in a city. Sound advice. So you, you look at what these liberals did in places uh, pre-1848 in Europe, and you look, as this column rather brilliantly pointed out, you look at apartheid-era South Africa, um, and you see urban liberals who are actually thriving under an oppressive regime, but congratulate themselves on occasionally criticizing it, on uh, offering up clever newspaper articles about how awful everything is. You see it today in, in China and Russia. But it was the mention of South Africa that particularly resonated with me. The line that Simon Cooper wrote this morning in the Financial Times was something like, urban liberals sat around their swimming pools mocking the government that privileged them while black maids served cake. It's a surprisingly sustainable way of life. As long as we feel we've somehow vented our spleen, we've declared our virtue, Oh, there's another one, virtue signaling, as if somehow being proud of doing the right thing is something that you should be ashamed of. They've managed to turn virtue signaling into a pejorative, into an insult, just like social justice warrior, just like liberal. And if you do live quietly but complainingly under these regimes, you're complicit in them. And because South Africa was mentioned in this article, and because I had heard of Hussein before I was invited to be here tonight, but I hadn't joined the dots... The dots are quite easily joined because the first I heard of Hussein was when I was reading Nelson Mandela's autobiography, The Long Road to Freedom, in which he talks of one night in Robin Island when he was close to surrendering. He was close to giving up his cause, his anti-apartheid campaigning. He was facing, after I think some 20 years already in jail, a crisis of conscience and a crisis of confidence. And he read the writings, the words of Hussein and found the strength within himself to reject the government's invitation to sign a, a declaration of defeat or surrender and uh, determined instead to carry on resisting and to carry on fighting. So I had heard of Hussein. I, I remembered the line in Mandela's book and I, I didn't, I, you'll forgive me for this, I don't imagine anybody else would have done it either, but I didn't go off and undertake a huge amount of research. But I did return to Mandela and learn also that Hussein inspired Mahatma Gandhi. So if you look at two figures from recent history, two names that resonate still throughout the world, and you learn, because you've had the privilege of being asked to an event like this this evening, that they both cited Hussein as a shining example of the, the life well lived and the ultimate sacrifice ultimately, ultimately made, you, you realize that there is something here that can reach over 1,400 years of history and provide a personal example, curiously detached, actually, from both politics and religion and focused instead upon the fundamental goodness, bravery, and dignity of one individual whose example we can follow. It, it resonated with me. And then, of course, as I continue to try to make a list of words that have somehow had their meanings changed in recent years, I, I realized and I think I've got this right, I'm sure Ali will correct my history if I've got it wrong, but I realize that Hussein and the 75 
people who fled with him was actually an asylum seeker. He, he might have been a grandson of the prophet. He might have been a, a very wealthy and powerful man. But he was, when he fled an oppressive regime after refusing to pledge allegiance to it, he was actually, and he became immediately, a seeker of asylum. Another phrase that in Britain in 2018 has become a pejorative, a negative, an insult. And who provides asylum? Social justice warriors. And what do they do when they've done it? Oh, they virtue signal. And what do we call all of these people who think that somehow doing the right thing by your fellow man and woman is the right thing to do? Oh, we call them liberals. We call them lefties. So let's, let's think about some other words that perhaps fall into this paradigm that I'm trying to describe this evening, this curious, curious place we've arrived at where not only is it acceptable to mock and vilify and insult people like the Who Is Hussein organization for daring to try to do what is right, but also somehow to, 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 to question their very sincerity, to question their integrity, to try to turn things that should be fundamental goods into bads. So that phrase virtue signal struck me. And then oddly, I realized they've done the same thing to health and safety. If you read right-wing newspapers, health and safety has become a byword for uh, government interference, for um, the nanny state, as if somehow there's something wrong in promoting health and safety. And we've allowed this to happen, and we haven't actually noticed. It's, it's that old analogy of boiling a frog which I'm, I'm assured by veterinarians and biologists isn't actually true. But the old metaphor is that if you put a frog in water and turn the heat up very, very, very slowly, the frog will die without noticing because the, the, the heat increases at such an incremental rate that by the time it's too late for the frog to hop out of the pot, it's too late for the frog full stop. And that seems to be what's happened to public discourse in Western society at the moment because asylum seeker shouldn't be a dirty word. Health and safety... How, so how have we ended up living in a place where people get paid a million pounds a year to write newspaper columns telling their readers that there should be less health and less safety in their lives? If you think I'm exaggerating, try another phrase that's very common and very, very intrinsically linked to social justice. And you've read these articles, you, you've seen these people on your television, you've heard this two-word phrase used as a pejorative, as an insult, You've, you've heard this phrase used as something that we should all be opposed to, something that we should feel infringes upon us or uh, unfairly promotes the undeserving. Uh, it's a phrase you, you, you've probably heard a hundred times already this month, depending on where you hang out, I suppose. If you read the Daily Mail, you've probably heard it a thousand times. But, but the phrase is, and think about this, human rights. Now, Theoretically, the only people who should be opposed to human rights are people who've decided that they're not human. And the only people who should be opposed to rights for any creature are people who despise freedom, people who embrace oppression, people who are precisely the same people who have turned asylum seeker or virtue signaling or health and safety or liberal, into pejoratives, into dirty words. And we watch it happen every day. And it's only for someone who talks for a living, I've only relatively recently noticed how, how debased we've allowed these phrases to become. Multicultural is another one, actually. Multicultural has become a dirty word. Multicultural has become something that right-wing commentators routinely tell us is, is not to be desired. So what I sometimes do is I find myself thinking, what, what's the opposite of this bad thing? that you're telling me about. What's the opposite of multicultural? Monocultural. Monochrome. For Oasis fans among you, monobrow. Mono is not good. One flavor in life is not a choice any of us would make with open minds and open eyes. Multicolored is better than black and white. We, we know all of this, and yet all these phrases, asylum seeker, human rights, virtue signaling, health and safety, liberal, multicultural, they've all become negatives. And so has social justice. Because anybody who speaks up for it automatically becomes a social justice warrior. 
So why do what is right? Why, why try to live the good life? Why try to do the right thing? Why try at all to, to seek to recognize? Because most of the time we won't succeed. Most of the time we will fall short. We'll be found wanting. But why, why even try to do the right thing? And this is, I mean, it's the hardest lesson humanity has ever faced, that the encouragement of altruism, the idea of selflessness. And again, by essentially embracing death rather than embracing compromise and surrender, Hussein's example here shines through the centuries. But, but we are not him, and, and we are not, there may be some exceptions in this room, but, but we will not have that strength. We will not lay down our lives to make a point or to fulfill a principle or to resist oppression. What can we do? What can we do? And, and again, you find yourself greeted with a, almost a, a cavalcade of criticism when, when you suggest doing anything at all. During the refugee crisis, anybody who suggested, for example, that they wanted to see the government do more, anyone who felt a degree of embarrassment that the fourth at the time, so it's before the Brexit vote, the fourth richest economy in the world was doing less than almost any other country in Europe to embrace the people fleeing the wars that we'd essentially started and failed to finish. Anybody who suggested that refugees should perhaps be provided with a warmer welcome was told that they were complete hypocrites because you haven't got any refugees in your spare bedroom. And it works. This insane rhetoric works. People sort of hear it and think they've actually made a good point. As a, as a radio phone host, I spend my life dealing with people who speak almost undiluted hogwash and then sit back and pat themselves on the back for saying something brilliant. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, you haven't got a refugee in your bedroom, have you? So you're not allowed to prove of refugees. Mate, I would quite like to see my taxes go to the NHS, but I'm not going to start doing open heart surgery in my kitchen. It's a fairly straightforward relationship. So why, if you're not blessed with an altruistic outlook, and, and I, I think there is a danger. I understand what they mean when they use the phrase virtue signaling. This, this notion of walking the walk, but, or, or beg your pardon, talking the talk, but not walking the walk. The idea that actions do speak much louder than words. How, how can you communicate to people who use phrases like a, asylum seeker as a negative, human rights as a pejorative, multicultural as a negative, virtue signaling as something to be embarrassed about or ashamed of, uh, health and safety as a bad thing? I, I wonder, increasingly, as, as I get older, and I'm feeling very old tonight, I, I had no idea when I accepted this information um, just what a youthful organization and, and what a youthful bunch of trustees ran who is Hussein. So I'd like to thank a significant portion of the audience for being very old. Thank you. <laughs> or at least, at least older than me. That's comforted me enormously this evening. So, so how, how do you communicate to people that the message that if we could all just be a bit nicer to each other, or in the words of those great cultural philosophers, Bill and Ted, if we could all just be excellent to each other, then life would actually get better for all of us. How do you communicate that? And I wonder, increasingly, as enmity gets worse, as society seems more fractured, as, as fighting seems to be more commonplace, not just in the, in the political sphere, but increasingly outside it. I, I wonder if one of the best ways to explain and express common humanity is, is actually to come at it from the other end of the telescope and, and, and approach it from what could be, could be loosely described as, as selfish rather than selfless. Because social justice is largely about selflessness. It is largely about doing things that won't be of immediate benefit to you personally, except to your soul, if you're religious, or perhaps to your conscience, if you're not, or, or even perhaps to a, to a slightly uh, self-congratulatory sense of, of having done the right thing. But, but what would happen if you didn't know where you were in society? So I've been reading a lot of John Rawls's work. John Rawls is a, is a philosopher, an American philosopher, who was at his peak, I think, in the 70s. And, and he came up with something called the veil of ignorance. 
And the veil of ignorance is applied chiefly to a justice system, but I think it probably applies to everything else. And what Rawls argued was that if you didn't know where you sat on the ladder of society, but you were charged with approving of or disapproving of certain laws, then you would actually act in a much more equable fashion than if you knew, for example, that this law was going to persecute or oppress 80% of the population, but you were in the 20%, so by all means, carry on, bring that law in, I'm going to be fine. I like this law. I'm in the 20%, I'm winning. But if you didn't know whether you were 20% or 80%, you'd be entertaining the possibility that if this law came in, you were going to be on the wrong end of it. You were going to be one of the people getting stamped on. You were going to be one of the people getting oppressed. So I, I, I wonder if, if that extends beyond law and moves instead into every area of, of public sphere, I wonder whether that's a way to reclaim these words, actually, from those who would have us think that being good, that trying to be good, is somehow bad. Because if you recognize the possibility that you might be a refugee in this society over which we've drawn the veil of ignorance, then the suggestion that we should leave refugees drowning in the sea probably wouldn't seem quite as attractive to you as it would if you had genuinely entertained the possibility of one day being one. And maybe not you, maybe just someone you love, someone you care for, maybe just someone you know. And if you extend this veil of ignorance in, into all other areas of life, then quite a lot of these phrases that have been rendered negative despite being fundamentally positive, they lose their bite, they lose their sting. Would you be opposed to multiculturalism if you didn't know what culture you belonged to while framing laws, while building society, while introducing institutions? If you effectively tried to teach and treat everybody the same as being fundamentally equally deserving of dignity, compassion, and decency. Of course you would. But if you are building a society in full knowledge of where you sit in it, then you are, and and plenty of people who fall for this snake oil, plenty of people who fall under the spell of latter-day demagogues are not bad people. The distinction between liars and people who have fallen for lies is probably the most crucial political challenge facing British and American society at the moment. They're not not all bad people. But if you know where you are in society and someone encourages you to look down on others, to blame your problems on people less fortunate than yourself, on people recently arrived from other countries, Uh, on people who perhaps follow a different faith or no faith, if you're encouraged to blame your problems on them by people up there, you're a lot more likely to fall for it if you know where you sit in society. If we can build somehow a sense of commonality, a sense of unity by recognizing, to use a phrase from my own religious background, that there but for the grace of God go I, then perhaps we all start being a little bit nicer to each other, a little bit more compassionate, a little bit more decent. We all perhaps start seeing a little bit more social justice in our lives. And, and I'm, I'm going to get a bit personal now, if I may, because I, I think that my own life and background has, has kind of given me a taste of what the veil of ignorance can do. Because I I was adopted as a a baby. I was 28 days old when I was adopted. And I've been blessed with the the most magnificent parents. And I've never been remotely troubled or traumatized by that, as many adopted children can be in life. And I've been thinking about it a lot since becoming a dad. And I've been thinking about it a lot since watching my own country fall under the spell of people who think that human rights are bad, that social justice is hypocritical, that health and safety are things that we shouldn't fight for, that virtue signaling is somehow a sane position to adopt. I've been thinking a lot about about my own life and why I feel about many things the same 
as the men and women behind who is Hussein. And, and I think it's because I have, in the back of my mind, I have the kid who didn't get adopted. I have the kid who would have been born to a teenage mother in Ireland in 1972 and would have been raised probably in care, probably by some of these nuns and monks we've read about recently who would have inflicted, if I was lucky, they would have inflicted fairly horrible experiences upon me. I wouldn't have had a loving home. I wouldn't have had material comfort. I wouldn't have had parents who essentially dedicated their lives to my sister and I. I wouldn't have had the golden tickets that such parents are sometimes fortunate enough to be able to buy for their children. And I wouldn't have had the life that I've had. I wouldn't have my radio show either. That might be a good thing. I'm not sure. But when I think of, of that unadopted boy and I think about society, what I realize is that I would have been the recipient of more social justice, not the donor, not the architect, not the giver. And I, and I, I think as we approach this very curious junction in Western history, when we see oppressive regimes rising, when we see people like Donald Trump achieving power and popularity while promising to exclude huge swathes of the population from his own country, if he can, while defending some of the most unpleasant individuals and practices on, on an industrial scale, I, I wonder whether we all need to start recognizing that the boot could be on the other foot. However secure you think you are, however blessed you think you are, however lucky you think you are, if it was the other way round, how would you want everybody else to behave? That might be the way, just to start reclaiming these phrases and these ideas and these, these fundamental notions of goodness that underpin most religions certainly the Abrahamic ones, and which absolutely underpin the story of Hussein. The idea that actually, if the cards had fallen slightly differently, I would need help, I would need support, I would need social justice. So, you know what? Maybe I am going to put my shoulder to the wheel. Maybe I am going to get involved in organizations like this one. Maybe I am going to start speaking up a bit more. Maybe I am going to start picking fights with the people who say you can't support refugees unless you've got 17 sleeping in your spare bedroom at the moment. Maybe I'm not going to just sit still, actually, as these, these powers gather pace, as these ancient hatreds rise. Living in an era which historically is terrifying. We have a combination of an economic crisis and a refugee crisis combining to create atmospheres in Europe and America that allow the vilest of individuals to peddle the most horrible of doctrines to people who are so desperate that they will listen. And they will listen. So I wonder whether our job is not just to argue with the demagogues, not just to debate with the snake oil salesmen, but actually through actions as much as words, I wonder whether our job now is to start drowning them out. Thank you very much.